we're going to begin with a little bit of a review. And we're going to go back to our first night together when we looked at Daniel chapter 2. And let's see how much you remember here. In Daniel chapter 2, you remember we studied this metal man image. And the metal man had a head of gold. And what did the head of gold represent? It represented Babylon. You guys are good. You're actually learning or you already knew it. One of the two. And then it had chest and arms of silver. And what did the chest and arms of silver represent? Persia or the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the belly and thighs of brass represented Greece. All right. And then we go to the legs of iron. That was the Roman Empire, or as Edward Gibbons put it, the Iron Monarchy of Rome. And what about the feet of iron mixed with clay? What was that? That was Western Europe or the divided Western Roman Empire. So we, we've learned that. Now, by show of hands, how many of you got all of those? How many of you got four of those at least? All right, no more hands went up. It was probably that last one, that divided Roman Empire that got you. Now, Tonight's prophecy is going to cover the same ground, only from a different perspective. You remember the other night I talked about those two twin brothers, Pete and Repeat? The principle was really repeat and enlarge. Well, this is one of those cases where God gives us a prophecy like he did in Daniel chapter 2, and he gives us another prophecy that covers the same material, but there are a few more, more details. And what at one time seemed impossible to understand becomes abundantly clear as we build on them and put them together. So, we're going to build on the material tonight that we've already covered. Now, if you remember, the vision of the statue from Daniel 2 was a dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar. But tonight, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 8, and we're going to see a vision that God gave to Daniel. So, let's pick it up in chapter 8, verse 1. This is what it says. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson... A vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Now, in Daniel chapter 8, Belshazzar is on the throne, and that means that many years have passed since Daniel chapter 2, and by this time Daniel is an old man, and that also means that the Babylonian Empire is getting close to the finish line, because in very short order it's going to be replaced by the Persians, which is what God said to Nebuchadnezzar back in Daniel chapter 2. So let's read on. It says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw... And behold, there stood before the river a, what does it say? A ram which had two horns, and the two horns were, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. All right, let's analyze this. So this is a ram with how many horns? Two horns. And are those horns the same size, yes or no? No, the Bible says one is bigger, one of them is higher than the other. And then it goes on, it says, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, notice those directions, so that no beasts might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. <clears throat> okay, let's pause for a minute and think about this. How much do we know so far? So this is a ram, and this ram has two horns, but the horns are not the same size. They're uneven. One of them is higher than the other. And this ram with uneven horns pushes to the west, to the north, and to the south. And of course, the big question is, what does all this mean? What does it represent? Well, I don't know. Maybe we should go check with the National Enquirer. You guys have an esoteric bookstore downtown? Maybe we could go check with that. What do you think? Is that what we want to do? No, nah, not when it comes to Bible prophecy. Remember the principle. We want to go line upon line, precept upon precept. We have to allow the Bible to speak for itself and define its own terms because the Bible will explain itself if you and I will simply allow it to do so. That's why I've always said you have to read the whole thing. And that's why every night we've had a motto. Do you remember the motto? If it's in the Bible, and if it's not in the Bible, that is not just something you say. If you just say it, it won't have any impact on you. But if you allow that into your heart, it will change your life in so many ways for the better. So what does it mean? Well, in this case, our job's actually going to be very easy because later in this same chapter, the angel Gabriel actually comes and explains what the ram represents. Listen to what he says. 
The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of whom? Media and Persia. So this is talking about the Persian Empire. It doesn't get any easier than this. Now, back when we were studying Daniel chapter 2, we had to compare prophecy to the pages of history, but now the Bible spells it out in detail. There can be no mistaking what the ram represents. It's the Medes and the Persians. Are you with me so far? Now, in this prophecy, this time, it doesn't start with Babylon because Babylon is just about finished. It starts with the Medes and Persians, which was a coalition government made up of two nations. Both of these nations, the Medes and the Persians, have both been oppressed by Babylon, so they join forces to defeat Babylon. So the ram has two horns, it says, and one of them is higher than the other because the Persians are stronger than the Medes. That's why sometimes we just refer to it as the Persian Empire in history. And this gives us a new principle. Because in Bible prophecy, animals are often used to represent political powers or kingdoms, and so are horns. So in this case, you have one animal, the Medo-Persian Empire, with two nations, two horns. Make sense? Now... As we keep moving further through the books of Daniel and Revelation, you're going to see these symbols again and again. Animals, or sometimes beasts, and horns representing kingdoms. Keep that in mind. That's a principle that's going to show up over and over again in Bible prophecy. Now, you'll notice that this ram has uneven horns, which matches history perfectly. The Medes and the Persians were a coalition government, but they were not equal partners. The Medes were there first... And later the Persians joined them, and before long the Persians overshadowed the Medes and became the bigger half of the empire. And the Bible tells us that this ram pushes in three different directions. It pushes to the west, it pushes to the north, it pushes to the south. And that's exactly how the Persians conquered the world. They started in what is modern day Iran, and they pushed their way in three directions in order to take the whole Babylonian empire. So the prophecy is absolutely accurate. Years before it happened, Daniel saw it all. But that's not everything he saw. Let's keep reading here. Daniel says this, And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from where? From the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn. Pay attention to that notable horn. The goat had a notable horn between its eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. So this goat attacks the ram. It goes on, it says, There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. So as Daniel watches, a goat with one big horn suddenly comes from the west and smashes into the ram. So who is the goat? If you were to hazard a guess, who would you think this goat was? Yeah, it's the Greeks, just like the belly and thighs of bronze back in Daniel chapter 2. Alexander the Great conquered the Persians at the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC, and they formed the next Mediterranean Empire. And again, we don't really have to guess about this at all, because Gabriel comes and he tells us exactly who this is. Look down in verse 21 and 22. It says, And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. You see how easy this is? The goat's the kingdom of Greece, and who do you suppose is the large horn? It's Alexander the Great. If you just read the whole thing, the Bible almost always spells it out for you. And this goat moves so fast, the Bible says, that its feet don't even touch the ground, and that also matches Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world in four years flat. 2 million square miles, 20 million people, all by the time he was 32 years old. Now, so much of this so far has really been review. But then the prophecy adds some detail that we didn't see in Daniel chapter 2. And this is where it starts to get really interesting and where it gets to be really clear that the Bible is more than just a book, that it has a divine source. You'll see what I mean as we get into this. In, in verse 8, it says this. Therefore the male goat grew very great, 
But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. So the, the great horn breaks off, and it says it's replaced by four more horns. So what does that represent? Again, we don't really have to guess or speculate because Gabriel explains that too. It says, as for the broken horn and for the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Now, this is absolutely fascinating when you begin to study the history of it. Alexander, if you know the history of this, Alexander had led his armies all the way to the borders of India. And when he gets there, he assumes he's running out of world to conquer. In fact, the, the history books tell us that he cried because there was nothing left to conquer. And his men are getting fed up after years on the road away from their families. So he turns around and he heads back home. But he never makes it. Ironically enough, he stops in the ancient city of Babylon in the same place where years before, two kingdoms before, the hand had written on the wall, the severed hand, meeny, meeny, tickle, you farson. He's in that very same palace and he suddenly dies. Now most historians think that he actually drank himself to death, that his successive lifestyle finally caught up with him. He could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself. Some of them say maybe he died of malaria. We really don't know. But as he was dying, one of his four generals, how many generals did he have? Four generals came and asked him, to whom will you give your kingdom? To which Alexander replied, I'll give it to the strongest. So now the Greeks need a king, and there's a power struggle when Alexander dies, and when the dust finally settles, the kingdom is broken up into exactly four parts under Alexander's generals. Just like the Bible predicted centuries before. You've got to ask yourself, if you're a skeptic of the Bible, you've got to ask yourself, how can that be? You've got Cassander to the west, you've got Lysimachus up in the north, you've got Seleucus in the east, and Ptolemy who's ruling in, in, north of, in the north of Africa. So one horn becomes four horns exactly the way the Bible predicted with absolute uncanny accuracy. And it gets even more amazing. It says, and out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great. So first we had a notable horn, and then we had four horns, and now we have a little horn. It comes from one of the four winds of heaven. This is very important that you understand this. Many people say it had to come from one of the four horns, but if you, if you look at it in the original Hebrew, it's very clear that the, the antecedent is, is the four winds, all right? It came from one of the directions on the compass. Some people think it came from the four horns, but the original language is very specific. It comes from one of the four winds or one of the four directions. Now, you tell me, based on what we've already studied, what kingdom replaced the Greeks after the at the Battle of Pydna in 168 BC? That would be the Romans. Now, I want to slow down and I want to read this very carefully because it's very important. It says, and out of one of them, the four winds, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Now you tell me, what place would Daniel consider to be the glorious land? The promised land. Some of the older translations, it's translated the pleasant land. What would that be? Folks, it's talking about the land of Israel. Now you tell me, did the Roman Empire ever occupy the land of Israel? Absolutely, it did. The entire ministry of Jesus happened under Roman occupation in the Roman province of Palestine. So it says it grew to the glorious land and it grew up to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Now, I wish we had more time tonight so we could really dig into the amazing details found in this passage. But we have a lot of ground to cover, and I think some of this will really amaze you once we've started to study Daniel chapter 7. But for tonight, we're going to skim over the surface and read the whole prophecy because we're headed to a very specific point. It says, he, speaking of this little horn, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Okay. Who is the prince of the host? It says he exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. Who is this prince of the host here? 
It's Jesus, folks. In Revelation chapter 19, he leads the armies of heaven riding on a white horse. It's a clear reference to Jesus there in Revelation 19. In Joshua chapter 5, Jesus appears to Joshua and describes himself as the commander of the Lord's hosts. All right? Isaiah calls him the Prince of Peace. And in Daniel chapter 9, which is probably more relevant to what we're studying right here, it refers to him as Messiah the Prince. Jesus is the prince of the host. And did Rome ever attack Jesus? Absolutely. Jesus died on a Roman car cross. It was, the, it was the Romans who put a crown of thorn on his head. So yes, they did that. And did Rome ever put an end to the sacrifices in Jerusalem? Again, they absolutely did. It was the Romans who sacked the temple in AD 70, and that's when it was destroyed. Now, that's not the whole picture, not by a long shot, there are a lot of details here that you'll probably want to look at again after we studied some more subjects. But there's no question that this is describing a conflict between Jesus Christ and Rome. It goes on. Verse 9 now, it says, Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So this is a description of Rome, and again, there are details you might want to come back to and study after we've covered a little more ground, but for right now, let's go and see what Gabriel says, because for every other part of the vision, he gives a lot more detail. It says, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes, he shall even rise against the prince of princes. So are you getting the sense that maybe something really bad is coming up this? Is it possible that this is pointing us toward the Antichrist that we'll be talking about in just a few nights? Is this a hint that the Antichrist will show up in the region where the Roman Empire was? Maybe. We're going to study that on another night. But this much is clear. The next empire in this sequence is Rome. So you've got to wonder, why doesn't Gabriel just name Rome? He named the Medo-Persians. He named the Greece Empire. Why didn't he name Rome? Why not say Rome? Well, we don't know for sure, but we can speculate a little here. Who was in power when the early Christian church got started? That was the Romans, wasn't it? And who persecuted the early Christian church? That was the Romans. So maybe, and this is just an idea, but maybe it doesn't name Rome by name in order to preserve the Bible as the first century church is taking the gospel message to the whole Roman Empire. If the gospel had actually said Rome, life might have been even harder for the early Christians who were already considered a threat to the security of the empire. So let's review what we have so far. This prophecy covers the same period of time as Daniel chapter 2, but with different details. It doesn't mention Babylon because Babylon is just about to be finished. But then in Daniel chapter 2, we had the chest and arms of silver, which represented the Medes and Persians. And in Daniel chapter 8, we have this ram with two uneven horns. And in Daniel chapter 2, you have the belly and thighs of brass, which represent the Greeks, and under Alexander the Great. But then in Daniel chapter 8, the Greeks were a goat with one big horn. And then, of course, that one big horn breaks off, and it's replaced by four new horns, and four generals rise to power exactly as the Bible says. It's amazing. That's actually uncanny how accurate that is. In Daniel chapter 2, the legs of iron were the Roman Empire. And then something of that empire continues into the feet, which are part of iron and part of clay. And it's replaced by the divided Western Empire, which broke up into ten parts. Remember we studied that? Ten toes on the image and ten parts. But Daniel 8 works a little differently here. In Daniel chapter 8, all of Rome is covered by this little horn. Both the pagan Roman Empire and the divided Western Empire that sometimes is referred to as Papal Rome. It covers this whole period of history from the legs all the way down through the toes. And I think that will become more obvious on a coming night as we get a little deeper into this. But for right now, here's what I want you to see. In Daniel chapter 2, the next thing after the feet was the stone that came from the sky. And what did that represent? The second coming of Jesus Christ. But in this prophecy, something else comes next. And this might be the most incredible part of the prophecy by far. I want you to listen to this. So far we have a ram, a goat, and a little horn. And then we get one more thing. Listen. 
And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now that's different. There is no animal. There's no horn, which means we're not talking about a kingdom or a military power. This is just 2,300 days. Literally in the, in the original language, it says 2,300 evenings and mornings. And that's because back in those days, they measured days differently than we do. You and I measure days from midnight to midnight, right? We got that from the Romans. But in the Bible, people measured days from sunset to sunset, or as the Bible sometimes says, from evening to evening. So when the sun set at the end of the day, the day was over. So sunset on Monday would actually be the beginning of Tuesday. Sunset on Tuesday would actually be the beginning of Wednesday, and so on and so forth. That's why when you read the creation account in the book of Genesis, it says in the evening and the morning were the first day. In the evening and the morning were the second day. The day ended at sunset. So what does this mean? Why do we suddenly have 2,300 days or 2,300 evenings and mornings? Well, as with the other parts of the vision, Gabriel came back and gave us more detail. So let's look at what he has to say. It says, And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And that's it. There's nothing more. Gabriel says, Daniel, prophecy's true, but I want you to seal it up because it's talking about something that's going to happen a long time from now, sometime in the future. That's it. No names, no horn, no beast, no nothing. There's absolutely nothing in the way of explanation. So some people say, well, then maybe it's not important. Maybe we don't need to understand this part. Except that Daniel thinks it's important. It's so important that it really, really bothers him. Listen to what it says in verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Now, let me ask you. Why didn't Daniel understand? Or what didn't he understand, maybe I should say? What did he not understand? Did he understand the ram? Yeah, Gabriel told him what the ram was. How about the goat? Absolutely. Did he understand the little horn? Certainly. He had lots of detail. There's only one part he doesn't understand, and that's the vision of the 2300 days. So some people say, well, does that mean we, we can't figure it out? Maybe it's not important. Maybe it's just there because the angels convinced God to put something in the Bible to confuse us. Do you think that's true? No, of course not. This prophecy is important, and before we're finished, you're going to see that God doesn't actually leave us hanging. And before we're finished tomorrow night, again, you better have your shoes tied tight. All right? I'm telling you, because your head might explode. You might want to wear a tight hat tomorrow night so your head doesn't explode. Because there are some proofs that are going to be happening in this prophecy that are going to blow your mind. All right? Daniel does get an answer, and we're going to get an answer too, but I'm going to make you work for it a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to use the principles we've learned. We're going to search through the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, to see what we can learn. We're going to go back and get the context. We're going to read the whole book. And the Bible gives us some very important clues. In fact, Gabriel does give us a few more details that we need to pay attention to. The first of these comes from Daniel 8, 17. It says, understand, son of, men, uh, son of man, that the vision refers to when? To the time of the end. Now that's why our subject tonight is called the time of the end, part one. It comes from this verse. The 2300 days has something to do with the time of the end. And clue number two comes from Daniel 8.19 where Gabriel says, For at the appointed time, the end shall be. So we know that the 2300 days points us to the end of time. And it's also talking about a time that's been appointed. Now, this is really remarkable because there is a time that's already been appointed. It's already on the prophetic schedule. In fact, if you go to the New Testament, something Daniel couldn't read, you'll find something really interesting about last day events. I want you to listen to what Paul says. It says here in Acts chapter 17, He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. What's he going to do? He's going to judge the world. So there is something that God has already appointed. It's already on the calendar. And it's the judgment day. He says he's appointed a day where he's going to judge the world. So let me ask you. 
Does the 2300 day prophecy have something to do with the judgment? Maybe. Clue number three comes from the prophecy itself. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, listen, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. I want you to notice that. It says the sanctuary shall be cleansed. That is a very important clue. So what does it mean to cleanse the sanctuary? Well, if you don't know, then you have to go to the rest of the Bible to find the answer. You have to research cleansing of the sanctuary. And sure enough, there's a lot of information on that. You can figure out what this is talking about. And, and I want you to pay attention carefully because what we're about to look at is one of the most important keys for understanding the book of Revelation. This is something you do not want to miss. The ancient sanctuary was a portable tabernacle the Israelites built and carried with them through the wilderness. It was the center of their worship and the center of their whole lives. Whenever they stopped moving across the wilderness and pitched camp, the sanctuary was, was the, the center of the camp, and they pitched all of their tents in a very orderly fashion around the tabernacle, around the sanctuary. And in later years, when they lived in the Promised Land, the tent was replaced by the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this was a very special building because it was not actually designed by a human being. The Israelites weren't just allowed to build anything they wanted. They had to follow a blueprint given by God to Moses himself. So I want you to, to listen to God's instructions as they're found in the book of Hebrews. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 8. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So they weren't following, they weren't allowed to follow a design that they'd made themselves. Moses had to follow the exact pattern that God showed him on the mountain. Why? Well, it's because the sanctuary was not just a building. It was also a prophecy from God. Let me take you on a little tour here. Because everything in the sanctuary pointed forward to some aspect of Jesus' ministry. In the outer courtyard, you have something there called the altar of burnt offering, where the Israelites would come to offer their sacrificial animals. And one of the most common animals that they would offer was a little lamb who pointed forward to whom? To Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then you move a little further into the outer court. And next to the altar was a large wash basin, wash basin called the lever, laver where the, where the priest had to cleanse themselves before they could go inside. It pointed forward to the cleansing that Jesus offers us so that you and I can step back into the presence of God. Even though we're still sinners, we can go into his presence because Jesus is the one that washes away our sins. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, you remember Paul wrote, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. In 1 John 1.9, it tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the laver represents the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. Now, those two items were out in the courtyard. So now we want to go inside of the sanctuary because everything on the inside also points to Jesus. This is going to be very fascinating. So as we move into the holy place, you realize the sanctuary was divided into two compartments. There was the holy place and then there was the holy of holies. Some people call it, most people refer to it as the most holy place. And in the holy place, you had three articles of furniture. You had a seven-branched golden candlestick, which was the only source of light. And, of course, that pointed to Jesus, who said, I am the light of the world. And then, across the room, on the other side of the room, you had a table with 12 loaves of bread. One loaf for each of the 12 tribes. And this was called the table of showbread. And, of course, that also pointed to Jesus, who said, I am the bread of life. And, of course, you had the priest himself who carried the blood of the lamb into the sanctuary. He was also a symbol of Jesus, who was our high priest. Jesus was the sacrifice, and he was the priest who offered the sacrifice. Both. Think about that. Why is that? Because the Bible says nobody took Jesus' life. Jesus gave his life. There's a difference. 
Very interesting. And then you go a little further into the, the holy place and up against the curtain that divided the holy place from the most holy place, you had something called the altar of incense where the sweet smelling smoke would go up over the veil into the most holy place into the very presence of God. And that smoke represented the prayers of God's people. And of course, because you and I are sinners, our prayers have to be mixed with the beauty of, and righteousness of Christ in order to be acceptable. But the priest would come up to this altar and there were horns on the altar and he would sprinkle the blood on the horns of the altar, which represents our sins being given to Christ, being taken up by Christ. Then... We're going to move into the most holy place of the sanctuary. And in the most holy place, this was the most sacred part in the entire camp of Israel. Whenever the Israelites pitched camp, the Bible says the presence of God would come down in this room and take up residence above something called the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a light that shone there, and you won't find the word in the Bible, but it's generally referred to as the Shekinah glory. The Ark of the Covenant represented the throne of God. So this whole thing is a prophecy of Jesus from the beginning to the end. And that's why God had to design it. Moses could have never gotten this right. And if you study the Bible carefully, you'll discover something really remarkable. The whole earthly sanctuary was actually a copy of something in heaven. I want you to look at what it says, but before you look at what it says, I want to tell you a story. When I was younger, I was in high school, there was a, a young man at the time, he was probably about 10 years older than me, but he was probably about 25 or 26, and he'd been raised a Christian, and he'd left the Christian faith, and he'd joined the Jewish faith. And I remember one day, we were working out in a garden one day. This, this, this place where I was going to school had about 600 acres that it farmed, and about 30 acres of it was in a garden that was done by hand. And we were working out in the garden, and so I asked him, I said, why, why did you join the Jewish faith? I was confused. I wasn't really confused. Maybe I was trying to understand. And he said, well, there's, there's not a single thing in the Bible that even indicates that Jesus was going to come. And even as a teenager, I remember saying, but what about all the sacrifices that they offered? I didn't know the half of what I know now, but it was kind of apparent to me that there were prophecies that pointed to Jesus, but he didn't see it that way. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. I would like to have him hear this now, and I would like him to hear Hear what it, I would like to hear what he has to say if he heard this. But, but when the Bible talks about the priest working in the temple, it says in Hebrews, it says that they, they serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. In other words, the earthly temple was a shadow of something else. It was a copy of something that already existed up in heaven. And if you understand that, if you understand that the sanctuary on earth is a copy of something in heaven, a lot of things you read in the book of Revelation just start to make sense. Let me give you an example. It says, then, the, I want you to say the blue words with me here. It says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen where? In the temple. So the sanctuary points us to Jesus and more specifically, it points us to what Jesus does for us in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8 says this as well. We have such, pay attention to these blue words, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesties, where? In the heavens. So who is our great high priest in heaven's sanctuary? Folks, this is Jesus. It says it again in the very next verse. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So Moses built the sanctuary here on earth based on the blueprints that God showed him, or at least Moses had it built based on those blueprints. It was a copy of the sanctuary in heaven, the real one that God built. So everything that happened on earth actually mirrored something that would happen in heaven. Now I want you to follow me carefully because this is about to get really amazing here. There were seven special feast days held every year in the sanctuary. How many? Seven, which is the number of? completeness. Very interesting. So, when you get a set of seven in Bible prophecy, you're getting a complete set of something. And the seven feasts all pointed forward to the ministry of Jesus. Let me show you this. Very interesting. Early in the year, you had something that they referred to as Passover. Most Christians have at least heard of Passover, even if they don't know what it's really all about. 
Passover was that holiday that celebrated Israel's escape from Egyptian slavery. And if you remember the story, the Israelites had to take a perfect lamb, sacrifice the lamb, and smear the blood on the doorpost of their house. So the angel of death, when it came to their house, would pass over their house. And this angel of death was charged with killing all of the firstborn in Egypt. But if the blood was on the doorpost, the angel would pass over your house and your firstborn would be spared. You probably know that story, many of you, but I want you to notice something here. The angel didn't come to the house and determine the worthiness of the firstborn. He only looked to see if there was blood on the doorpost. And if there was blood on the doorpost, he passed over the house. And that's why it's so important that we are covered with the blood of Christ. Because if we're our own worthiness, that angel's not passing over us because there's coming another time when people are going to be slayed at the end of time. We'll talk about that later in the series. But this was predicting the death of Christ, the Lamb of God, who gave his life so that you and I could escape the wages of sin, which is death. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says Jesus is Jesus our Passover. That's how Paul describes it. Jesus our Passover is sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And then you had the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was really part of the Passover. On the second day, all of the Israelites had to remove every trace of leaven, the Bible refers to it. We call it yeast today. They had to get it all out of their houses. Why? Well, because in Bible times, leaven represented sin. You remember Jesus spoke of the leaven of the Pharisees there in Matthew chapter 16. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul reminds us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Don't you know, Paul's saying, if you allow this sin to exist back here in the corner of the church, it will eventually infect the whole congregation just like leaven spreads through the whole lump of dough. Don't you know that? So, so leaven represented sin. This pointed forward to the fact that Jesus would not only die, but also remove sin from our hearts. Then the third feast was the Feast of first fruits, which happened on the third day after the Passover lamb was slain. They would go into the field and they would look for the first part of the spring harvest that was already ripe and they would pick it and they would wave it before the Lord as an act of faith, saying, we believe that the rest of the harvest will also ripen thanks to you. That's what happened on the third day. And you know what happened on the third day after Jesus died, don't you? He was raised from the dead. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept. And so because Jesus rose from the dead, you and I can have faith that the rest of the harvest will also rise from the dead when Jesus comes again. Then we had the Feast of Pentecost, or sometimes it was referred to as the Feast of Weeks, which celebrated Israel's arrival at Mount Sinai on the 50th day after leaving Egypt. Did you know it was 50 days? Pentecost, five. Did you catch the five in there? A pentagon has five sides. Penta means five. On the 50th day, five sets of ten here. On the 50th day after leaving Egypt. And what happened on that day? Well, back in the Old Testament, fire fell on the top of the mountain and the people heard the voice of God speaking the Ten Commandments to them. It was a powerful moment as God established His special covenant people. And there's an old Jewish legend that says that God spoke the Ten Commandments that day and when He did, He did it in all of the languages of the world at the same time. Now that's just an old legend, it's not something you'll find in the Bible. But on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament, they would have known that story. That was part of their culture. So imagine the impact when fire suddenly falls on the heads of the disciples and they start to speak the gospel in the language of everybody present all at the same time. And Pentecost happened 50 days after the crucifixion. What we read about in Acts chapter 2 happened 50 days after the crucifixion. So the Feast of Pentecost actually predicted the beginning of the Christian church. Then came the summer. So you had a long break before the next feast. But in the fall, you had something called the Feast of Trumpets, which was a very solemn occasion. They would blow the trumpets in the camp of Israel to warn people that they only had 10 days to get things right with God. Why? Because in 10 days, you would have something called the Day of Atonement. Does that remind you of Daniel chapter 8? We'll get back to it. The Day of Atonement was the most solemn feast of the whole year. It was known as the Day of Judgment. 
You had to make everything right. You had to repent of all your sins because if you didn't on that day, they would kick you out of the camp of Israel forever. It was the day of judgment. And then came the last feast day of the year, and that was called the Feast of Tabernacles. And some people call this the Feast of Booths because once a year, the Israelites would leave their homes and go into temporary shelters to celebrate the fact that God had kept his word. He had led them through the wilderness and brought them safely to the promised land, and now they could have permanent homes. But in remembrance, they would go back and live in something like they might have lived in in the wilderness. Now, what's really interesting is the language in Revelation 21.3, which happens after the second coming, it says that after Jesus returns, he says that the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. So this is a celebration of the second coming. It points forward to the day when God will take up residence with the human race, and you and I will finally be in the heavenly promised land. Now I want you to look at this list very carefully because you've got the death of Christ in the Passover. You've also got the resurrection of Christ on the third day during the, fe first, the Feast of First Fruits. You've got the day of Pentecost or the beginning of the Christian church. And then you have a long break, just like in history. You had the Dark Ages fall across the planet not long after the church got started. And in the fall, you had a final warning followed by the judgment and then the second coming of Christ. The feast days represented all of that. It's the whole ministry of Christ predicted in a structure that existed 1,500 years before he was born. This is absolutely astonishing. In fact, it's clear that the feast days given in Leviticus 23 were actually a Bible prophecy pointing directly to Jesus. So what does all of this have to do with Daniel chapter 8? It has everything to do with Daniel chapter 8. Because Daniel chapter 8 is referring to the Day of Atonement, or sometimes today we refer to it as Yom Kippur. It was the most solemn of all of the feasts, and it was considered the Hour of Judgment. It was also the day that they literally cleansed the sanctuary. All year long, if you know the Jewish system, all year long the animals were sacrificed for sin and the blood was taken into the sanctuary which symbolized Jesus taking his sin on ourselves. But that also meant symbolically that the sin was being transferred to the sanctuary into the presence of God himself. And can sin remain in the presence of God? Absolutely not. So once a year they had a special ceremony on the day of judgment when they cleansed the sanctuary from all the sins that had been transferred inside. I want you to look at what Leviticus 23 tells us. It says, also, the tenth day of the seventh month shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. So this was the last chance to make things right with God. Because if this feast was over and you didn't make things right, you didn't repent of your sins, then you were cast out of the camp of Israel forever. You were removed from among God's people. Now I want to go back to Daniel chapter 8 and I want you to think about this very carefully. Because we had three clues to help us understand the 2300 days. First of all, we discovered that it was a prophecy about the time of the end. Remember we talked about that? And then we found out that it was for a time appointed and in the New Testament, Paul told us that the judgment has already been appointed. And then it said in the 2300 days, at the end of the 2300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. And in the Old Testament, we discovered that they actually cleansed the sanctuary on the day of judgment. Are you starting to get a sense of what's going on here? Daniel chapter 8 and the 2300 days are talking about the judgment. We're going to delve into this a little deeper tomorrow night and it's going to blow your mind. But then in Daniel chapter 7... You find, a, you find a description of the judgment itself. Now, now we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7 on a coming night as well. But here's what you're going to discover. It has the same progression of kingdoms. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And after Rome, this is what it describes. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. That's God was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. Now ask yourself a couple questions here. First of all, 
Why in the world would God need a court? And why would he need books? I mean, we know why he needs a court because there's a judgment going on. But why the books? Doesn't God know everything? Of course he does. But ask yourself, is there anybody in this judgment scene who wouldn't know everything? Yes, there are. It's the angels. They don't have perfect unlimited knowledge. And the Bible says they are absolutely fascinated with the story of our salvation. So when the Bible talks about the plan of salvation, it says it has things which angels desire to look into. They're intensely interested in how God is going about saving this fallen race. Paul says this, actually. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. So the angels want to know. God knows everything, but they don't. Fallen angels, you remember, were kicked out of heaven, and now God is planning on bringing you and me back into his kingdom. Don't you think the angels might have a few questions? Wait a minute, God, we're not so sure we want this here. Well, I think they're going to have questions because the angels are also thinking, feeling beings like we are. So God calls the judgment, and he opens the books, and he says, here, come and see. I'm not afraid of anything. Have a look. Examine the evidence. I am convinced that you're going to see that I'm doing the right thing. Now, do you know what this means for you? It means that your name will come up in the judgment. At some point, they're going to consider you. How do I know? Well, listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. For we must all, how many of us? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Here's another text from Romans 14.10. Listen to this. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. How many of us? All. Here's another text. This one's from Ecclesiastes 12. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that's bad news. Your name will come up the, in the judgment, and that's not good if you're being honest with yourself. If you know who you really are and the kind of things that go through your mind and some of the things that you've done, that's not good news. Because you know that you're not good. But there is good news. You want to hear the good news? I want to hear the good news. Jesus is the judge. That's the good news, folks. Look what it says in John chapter 5. For the Father judges how many? Some of you are saying, wait a minute, I thought God was going to be our judge. Well, I'm just showing you what the Bible says. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now think about this. The judge is the one who gave his life to save you. How can you lose? And there's more good news. Jesus is also the defense attorney. In John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, If anyone sins, we have an advocate. That's what you call a defense attorney. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now think about this. The judge is the same person as your defense attorney. If you've got Jesus, there is no way that you can lose. You may say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm scared. I know I won't make it. I know I can't face the judgment. And I'm glad you're saying that if you're saying that because you know what? You're right. You don't stand a ghost of a chance. But with Jesus, you're going to pass with flying colors. 2,300 days and the sanctuary will be cleansed. So is God trying to tell us something about the judgment? Absolutely. The warning goes out, the judgment begins, and Jesus comes. And tomorrow night, we're actually going to put some dates with this. We're going to show you this prophecy as a time prophecy from Daniel. And it will blow your mind. It will point us directly to Jesus on the cross. It will tell us the year he was going to be baptized. It will tell us the year he was going to die on the cross. And it will tell us the year the gospel went to the Gentiles with absolute uncanny accuracy. From hundreds of years before. And sometime just before he comes... We know from what we're studying tonight that the judgment begins. Before Jesus comes, the judgment begins. And that only makes sense, doesn't it? Because it wouldn't make any sense for Jesus to come and pass out rewards and then have the judgment later, would it? You can't pass out rewards and then have the judgment. You've got to have the judgment first and then pass out rewards. So the judgment is going to begin before Jesus comes. All right? We know that the judgment has already started before Jesus comes because there is a final message, a final warning that goes forth to the earth. It's, it's called the first angel's message of Revelation 14. 
We're going to get into this a little more on a future night, but I want you to listen to it very briefly. John says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. So there's a warning that goes out to the earth, to God's people, right before Jesus comes, that the hour of this judgment has come. It's already there, not will come but has come. So the world will discover at some moment just before Jesus returns that the judgment is already underway. The books are open, the angels are gathered, and the judgment begins. At some point, the world will know when it started. You want to know when? I hope you do, because I'm going to tell you about that tomorrow night. And again, Wear tight shoes so that you have your socks on when we're done. It will knock your socks off without even untying your shoes. But for tonight, let me ask you this. Why would you want to face God's throne without Jesus? Think about it. When you see what he's done for you, when you see the salvation that Jesus has given you, not because you deserve it, but because he was good enough, when you see him as the Passover lamb of God who gave his life to make sure that you would have a way to make it, what could possibly keep you from choosing Jesus? And my question to you, my, my, my thought that I'm going to leave with you tonight is a thought that I've said many nights, but I want it to go from your head to your heart. In, in that deepest place where you make that promise to God, have you truly committed to God and said, yes, Jesus, because of what you've done for me, I want to respond to that by living my life your way. There are many people that think, well, I'm saved. It doesn't matter. I can go on and do anything I want. But actually, if you're going on with your life doing anything you want, that is evidence that you're not saved. Saved people respond to what Jesus has done by living their lives his way. Now you're doing something because you want to, not because you have to. Think about it. If I believe I'm saved because of what I do, what is the entire rest of my life going to be focused on? What I do. I'm going to find this list of things that I have to do in order to be good enough to be saved. But as long as I cover the list, I'll think I'm saved. In fact, that's what the original Methodists were all about. Not anymore, but that's what the original method. There was a method to salvation. You do this and this and this and this and this and then you're saved. But if I think I'm saved by what Jesus does, now I know my salvation is secure. Where does my focus go? to Jesus and thanking him for it and to letting others know that Jesus wants to save them too. And isn't that what the Bible's all about? Love for God and love for our fellow man. That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. Love for God and love for our fellow man. And it all starts with having a proper understanding of salvation. Amen. And so my question tonight, have you accepted that salvation and in response to that salvation, have you made a deep commitment to say, yes, Jesus, because of what you've done for me, I want to live my life your way. It won't always be easy, but you will always have the peace of mind of knowing that you are on God's side. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it is amazing as we go through these prophecies how you have been trying to show us and teach us all the way through history that you are God. And Father, I pray if there's someone here tonight that's doubting Jesus, that they would, they would just give their heart to you, give their heart to Jesus, and make that commitment that says, God, I'm going to give you everything I've got for the rest of my life. I just pray for the Holy Spirit to work on each person here so that they, they don't just hear that they should make a commitment. But they actually do make that commitment. Help us to serve you because we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And tomorrow night, the time of the end, part two. And if you like tonight, you're really going to like tomorrow night. And if you didn't like tonight, you're really going to like tomorrow night. All right? God bless you guys. Have a good night. When will I see you again?